And good evening, one and all, and welcome to another edition of the Exxon. I'm Rob McConnell. We're coming to you from our broadcast center and studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. If you'd like to send me an email, exxon at exxonradiotv.com and all social media sites, Exxon Radio TV. <laughs> and for the programming we have available for you 24-7, 365 on the Exxon Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. And on Simul TV, the Exxon TV channel, channel 21. Simultv.com. My guest this hour, explanation is Stephen Bassett. He is the executive director of Paradigm Research Group, founded in 1996 to end a government-imposed embargo on the truth behind extraterrestrial-related phenomena. He has spoken to audiences around the world about the implications of formal disclosure by world governments of an extraterrestrial presence and engaging human race and given over 1,200 radio and television interviews. PRG's advocacy work has been exclusively and extensively covered by the national and and international media, including CNN, Fox, MSNBC, Washington Post, New York Times, New York Magazine, Washington Times, and the Chicago Tribune. Joining me now from Los Angeles International Export is our export? Airport. (laughs) He's the one and only Steve Bassett. Hey, Steve, welcome to the show. What are you doing at LAX? I'm not at the airport. Actually, I'm at the LAX Hilton, ah. which is we're just finishing up the uh, Conscious Life Expo here. Big, uh, big event, and every year several thousand people come, and uh, there's about 70 speakers. So, I've got one more wood workshop to do tonight. Uh, so I'm comfortably up here in the uh, second level, looking down on the, on the lobby, and uh, well, it's it's been a nice three days. Steve, what is the uh, what has been the consensus uh, at the expo been this year uh, when it comes to UFOs? <laughs> Believe me, that would be very difficult to ascertain. Uh, we're we're talking three thousand people. Yeah, I don't know a hundred lectures and workshops and so forth, and I, I I'm barely able to get down the hall to the buffet line. Oh my um, gosh! Uh, but let's just say that there's a lot of a lot of the speakers were addressing the ET issues, as well as uh, some disclosure stuff, and of course, a huge amount of of uh, what we we'll call spirituality and uh, New Age, uh, uh, new nice items. So again, not a good place to get a perspective. But I think it's very clear to me that the awareness of disclosure as a as a legitimate and ongoing reality. Mm-hmm. Our process is ongoing, is growing uh, around the country and around the world. I watch the internet. I get a tremendous amount coming across my my uh, computer desk. Right. Uh, so it, it's it's no longer about UFOs, really. They almost that's almost an afterthought in some ways. It's about extraterrestrials and it's about the confirmation of their presence, which is still and always will be a big deal. You know, Steve, you and I go back, uh, I think our producer said 26 years when you first came on the Exxon show. And, and all the hard work that you've done and others have done, are you any closer to getting that final d- bit of disclosure that will open up the floodgates to what you're talk- you've been talking about? Well, to clarify that, again, the goal of the advocacy movement is very defined. It's the formal confirmation or acknowledgement of this extraterrestrial presence by the heads of states of government, heads mm-hmm. of state of government. Uh, President Obama, President Trump, President Putin, President Ding, pick a president, major developed country. Any one of those could be the first to make the announcement. That is disclosure, capital D. Small d disclosure has been going on for 70 years. It takes many forms. There's some of it happening now. Uh, so we've always had that. As far as the announcement, the acknowledgement that really sets things in motion, that puts us in the post disclosure world, as I like to say, mm-hmm. we have, there have been efforts to get to it over the years, a uh, number of times, even before the end of the Cold War, and they don't quite make it. Um, so uh, we were really close as we approached the end of 2016, very close. Uh, I was. I had champagne already to pull out, start partying, hors d'oeuvres, the whole nine yards. Uh, that changed with the election. Now things have been sort of uh, much more su- been su- uh, suspended, not suspended, mm-hmm. but certainly subdued. However, we're anticipating some political developments, which could then 
reignite the disclosure process. Uh, I know who the players are. And uh, so 2019 could end up being the year, frankly. But uh, those things which would make that happen are pretty much out of my control. Yeah. Um, but nevertheless, we're watching things very closely. And so do I feel optimistic right now? I am feeling a bit optimistic. Steve, if, if, if uh, Hillary Clinton would have been elected president yeah. of the United States, do you think disclosure would have been completed by now? Yeah. She intended to do it. Um, she didn't want to talk about that mm -hmm. during the election because she thought it might hurt her prospects. It didn't. She did get forced to talk about it, but that was my doing. I, I pressed the story in Washington and got the reporters writing up stories and then going to them for comments, mm -hmm. uh, and they couldn't comment. Uh, there was no way they could do Q&A with these reporters, and so they started doing some orchestrated, careful statements throughout the campaign that had never happened before in any political campaign in America, uh, which kind of struck people rather on, as odd, but nevertheless generated a lot of media. Uh, but it didn't hurt her campaign. But she she wasn't. They, they were they weren't going to risk really engaging the issue um, until she made the White House, and she thought she would, and everybody else did, including the Pentagon, frankly. But, so um, uh, yeah, and so 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 because of all the extra media coverage of of her connection to the ET issue and mm -hmm. and her comments and Podesta's comments and her husband and Obama. Once she wins, the press are ready to pounce, really, all over the issue. And of course, once she wins, she's no longer really restricted from engaging it, uh, though possibly during the transition, they probably would have pushed it forward. But then once she's in the White House, it, it's over. Uh, she was going to disclose she wanted that legacy, uh, that legacy that was denied her husband 25 years earlier. She was. She intended to be the first woman president and the disclosure president, and frankly, go down in history as one of the great leaders of uh, of all time. So why didn't she go ahead with the information she had after she lost the election? <laughs> well, the answer is fairly simple. Uh, if they had uh, decided to say, okay, we've lost, but now let's start calling up the New York Times and let's start getting them in here and let's start talking about the last 25 years and what happened during the Rockefeller Initiative and everything else and why we were speaking out. They could have done that and, and they would have gotten the attention of the world and it would have maybe blown the issue up. They might have de definitely taken it to critical mass, uh, except that the person who would then be the disclosure president would be Donald Trump. And I can say with some confidence that uh, Senator Clinton and President Clinton uh, has a hatred for Donald Trump that uh, will be legendary. Yeah, but when it comes to the the disclosure itself, as well as you know what the truth actually is, should that hatred have been put aside in the best interest of the American public? Yeah, um, the list of things that should be put aside. Mm -hmm on the part of our political class in America right? so that we can pursue the business of the country is a very, very long list. Uh, and uh, that's one of the reasons things aren't working down here, Bob. Uh, we don't have a political class that's working in the best interest of the country. It's basically working in the best interest of the political class. Mm. And the deficiencies and mistakes being made are, are substantial. And they're on both sides of the aisle. They're both parties are doing this. But we don't have we don't have competent uh, and uh, visionary government. And we haven't for some time, and we're suffering because of it. And and they're just playing with that. I mean, I mean, they could have done it. It would have been an extraordinary maneuver. Uh, on the other hand, and I'm again I'm saying this in a bipartisan way. I I didn't vote for Hillary Clinton. So for those that think, oh no, I'm just selling selling her, selling mm -hmm. the Democratic Party. Uh, I think they and a number of other people calculated based upon everything they were seeing, that the current administration wouldn't be in the White House that long. And so why risk, uh, in other words, while it's somewhat self-serving, why not wait and see what happens? And then depending upon what happens with the administration, they could then speak up. So there's some, there's some substantial calculus be, uh, in, in play here. Uh, it's a pretty complicated chess game. 
uh, but I'm trying to follow it as closely sure. as I can. All right, Stephen, stand by. You and I have to take our first break. Exo Nation, Stephen Bassett is our special guest, www.paradigmresearchgroup.org. And Stephen and I will be back on the other side of this break as we continue here in the Exxon from our broadcast center and studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. I'm Rob McConnell. Don't go away. Stephen Bassett is my special guest, Exxon Nation, www.paradigmresearchgroup.org. As Stephen, we were talking before the uh, the uh, last break about how how you believe and other people believe that if Senator Clinton had been elected as president, that disclosure would have happened. What happens yes. now, Stephen, if, let us say, Putin or the Prime Minister of Britain, the Prime Minister of France, or or as funny as this may sound, the Prime Minister of Canada actually makes the disclosure. What would that mean to the UFO community? Disclosure is disclosure. Okay. Wherever it starts, the long-term implications are about the same. Short-term implications will vary. So if Justin Trudeau decided that, um, and I assure you that the, can the Canadian military and intelligence community is well versed on the ET issue, I believe that Canada was uh, supportive and helpful with the ET issue from the very get-go, going all the way back to the 40s and 50s. Uh, if he decided that he wanted to do that, uh, the effect would be profound. Uh, uh, Canada would certainly have some evidence to bring forward along with his statement that would be persuasive. Uh, and that would be it. The announcement would be out. And then it would be a question of which nations follow next. Would the U.S. immediately uh, confirm, or would it be U.K.? But some of them would, and before you know it, you got three or four, and then eventually it's it's every developed nation. So there's any number of... Now, there are some nations that simply would not... Prob their head of state would not be able to reach critical mass. Uh, but uh, all the developed world, certainly, that would be the case. And the fact is, is that if it's not the United States, the United States will suffer substantial, I would you say, public relations problems there would be a geopolitical impact. Um, the U.S. has been the leader of the truth embargo in the Western world. We certainly have put the most resources into ensuring that this issue remained closeted and contained. And so if another nation announces it, say, and, and worst case for the U.S. would be Putin without question, Right. then that nation gets all the glory, the leader gets the uh, accolades, probably the odd Nobel Prize, whatever, and the U.S. gets all the grief, meaning, why didn't you tell us? Right. But why if, have you hid this? But so, if Putin did have the information, and if Putin does. was able to to break the seal on the disclosure um, embargo, why doesn't he do it? Why doesn't he do it to put the U.S. to shame? When I was uh, interviewed by one of their national TV networks, Ren TV, in May of 2017 in Moscow, I talked about that, I talked about exopolitics and Putin. No one had ever done this before on Russian media, uh, and absolutely never in, in Moscow, in country. Uh, that's one of the things I said to the journalist. I said, if I had just five minutes with the, uh, President Putin, the one question I would absolutely ask is, why have you not disclosed the ET issue so far? I can guess why. Uh, I'm sure it's a complicated um, equation that he's he's considering but he hasn't done it it may be because he would feel it would would uh, make it more difficult for him to control uh, Russia's course because he's becoming increasingly more authoritarian it may be because he's worried about technological changes that could occur that could impact the Russian oil and gas industry they make a lot of money from oil and gas they got a lot right. of it they got a lot of territory 
and he may be worried that they wouldn't be able to transition to the new post-disclosure reality. I, I, I tried to make the case in that interview that it would benefit Russia hugely. Sure. Because extremely cheap energy, if that were one of the technologies that might emerge, would allow Russia to develop all kinds of of, um, of uh, projects and and utilize their vast natural resources in other ways. Uh, one thing they've got is land, and I assure you, land is going to be the most valuable thing next to water pretty soon. But that that Rick, that's a complicated assessment. This is there's one other possibility, and that is that. Uh, Russia does not have the uh, amount of, re of, of, of ET related technology under reengineering re in the U.S. We may be ahead of that because it's all about who gets the crash vehicles, right? Uh, and if that is the case, he may be concerned that if he pulls the rug out from the United States, that we might deny uh, access to that technology to Russia as opposed to other nations. But I am just, I'm just spitballing here. Uh, but he has chosen not to do it. But on the other hand, as I pointed out to you, maybe in another show, but I'm, I'm pointing out in my lectures now, the reason I went to Moscow to give that interview was to test the theory. Right. That Putin, what, what, what is Putin's view of that? And I, I, I interviewed with a, 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 a popular network, national network that, mm -hmm. that the Kremlin is quite comfy with. Um, I obviously had to get a visa in. And... Uh, I gave the interview and then I waited to see what would happen. I mean, maybe I wouldn't be able to get to leave the country. Maybe I'd end up being uh, Edward Snowden's roommate. Who knows? But I, I gave the interview. Then I met with uh, about six groups of, of individuals, many of whom had worked on the ET issue while in the Soviet and Russian military. Uh, and they're now kind of doing it on their own. In retirement, you know, we have that. Uh, and I met with them, six different groups. Uh, including a former chief of staff to a top Russian official, who was the most difficult. I think he was just sizing me up. But I did that to absolutely guarantee the Kremlin would know that I had come to Moscow and, and given this interview. I was pretty sure the CIA knew. So, all right, I've done the interview. Uh, I've met with these people. I leave the country and come back to go back to London, and I wait. Uh, a couple months go by. And the first, the first thing that I saw or heard was that the a couple of brief clips from my interview were run in uh, a Russian television station on 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 their national Ren TV network. Okay, great. Obviously, I didn't bother. The stuff it wasn't particularly political. And I waited a little bit longer, and then the film of my interview, the English language film of my interview, came to me. I, I received it. It wasn't what the network shot; it's what the journalist shot. But apparently, she was allowed to, to send it out, so I got that which meant that I could I could post it on my website, which I did, and it's up there now. I even uh, took the key political aspect of that uh, interview in Moscow and put it out as a press release in the United States. Of course, it was completely ignored by the entire American media. No big deal. And that's fine. I said, oh, so far, so good. And then came, you know, I think it was October, November of 2017, two articles turn up in Pravda RU, which is a... Russian-based internet news uh, with clearly ties to the government. Some would call it a propaganda site, but they do they do news. But clearly there's a Russian bias there, but sure. nevertheless, and it's an English language mm -hmm. deal, and it's all over the world. Two articles turn up in the space of 30 days in which they literally refer to my my coming to Russia and, and advocating for Putin to disclose. And I assure you, there is no way that those articles ever make it into Pravda RU if the Kremlin doesn't want them there. And so at that point, I, it confirmed to me that the idea of disclosure by President Putin was not something that bothered him at all. And naturally, I made sure through my interviews and other means that the Pentagon and the White House knew this. And that was the best I could do in 2017, because after the election, I was flat. I mean, I was just wiped out. I couldn't raise money, and I didn't have a project. But I did do that, and so that's the best I could do. Now, Xi Jinping is another matter. Uh, he's got a billion and a half people to manage, but they're very interested in space. They've sent, just sent a, sh a, a craft around uh, and landed on the far side of the moon. Mm -hmm. uh, they have big plans for a space station. And so they want to be a, a modern space engaged country. And so that that is a that means that if Xi Jinping could could benefit could China could elevate itself profoundly 
if Xi Jinping were to come out and say, yeah, there's an ET presence, we've known it for some time. Uh, here's the evidence. Why hasn't he done it? Well, if I had to manage a billion and a half people, I don't know what I would do. <laughs> I just don't know. I mean, he has an even more complex uh, uh, political dynamic in his country. So a major thing like that, they're trying to calculate what it would do. But the, the larger point here is that those who are still clinging to the idea that the people don't need to know this, and if they just keep their mouth shut, it, this will continue. This embargo will continue indefinitely. Are whistling by the graveyard. Disclosure it is inevitable. It's just a matter of which country goes first. When you started uh, this work many years ago, did you think the embargo would last this long? No. Absolutely not. I didn't think it could. Didn't think it was possible. Uh, but I underestimated both the political de events that would take place, mm -hmm. like the Iraq War, yeah. the Iraq-Afghanistan War, which is historically a, a, a grade nine, complete, total fiasco, um, uh, and a lot of other unpleasantness that took place. Uh, I, did, I, I underestimated just how bad the political dysfunction in America was going to get. So it drags on. Uh, it drove on longer than I thought, uh, but uh, so did a lot of other things, so I, I shouldn't complain. All right, Steve, stand by. You and I have to take our news break at the bottom of the hour. Index on Nation, our guest this hour, is Stephen Bassett. His website is www.paradigmresearchgroup.org. And we're speaking to uh, Steve from the Conscious Life Expo in Los Angeles, California. Once again, if you'd like to find out more about Stephen, paradigmresearchgroup.org. As and his uh, PRG media coverage website is paradigmresearchgroup.org forward slash articles forward slash PRG articles dot HTML. And we'll both be back on the other side of this break as we continue here in the X Zone from our broadcast center and studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Don't forget, we're now on the BBC Worldwide Service in English. We are going to be on Comcast later on this month and throughout the United States on iLaunch TV. I'm Rob McConnell. Don't go away. And welcome back, everyone. Stephen Bassett is our special guest, www.paradigmresearchgroup.org. Uh, Stephen, I understand that uh, you have done a, a presentation, an extensive presentation analysis of the uh, To the Stars Academy of Arts and Science. Tell us about that. Mm. Yes. Uh, this is, um, hmm. can I put this? For those that are not following it, uh, maybe just heard bits and pieces, it would be easy for someone to arrive at a conclusion that the developments with respect to this organization are not significant. Uh, I would understand that. However, I am following it very closely, and it's probably the most significant development in the history of the disclosure movement. All right. Um, so. Just to give your audience uh, just a brief introduction, uh, sometime in 2015, as this is my understanding, mm -hmm. and it is not I, I, it is not confirmed by the principals because I am not in touch with them. Uh, but it is my understanding that in 2015, uh, a significant number of individuals in the military intelligence complex made the decision that uh, they needed to make a move. There has always been people inside the military intelligence complex that favored disclosure. It's not a, they're not, it's never been monolithic, but they didn't have an, enough influence to, to call the shot. Uh, but in 2015, they, they were seeing a presidential candidate who was very favored to win, speaking repeatedly 
uh, or one of her surrogates about the ET issue, which had never happened before, and scores and scores of our articles, eventually 400, being printed about her connection to the issue. Uh, I, whether or not they knew that I was behind that and I was the one pushing that, I don't know. Though I was mentioned in about 130 of those articles, mm -hmm. including the New York Times. And so they had a real dilemma on their hands because I think they, they calculated, as I did, that she was going to disclose the ET presence, that that was going to be an issue for her. And uh, they knew about the connection back to the Rockefeller Initiative and, and her husband. And this idea that she would take that legacy was a very simple calculation. And so they had a real problem. What happens if President uh, uh, a President Clinton comes in office, basically puts her foot down, gets the the DOD people over to the White House and says, look, we're going to now bring this information out, whether you like it or not. That puts them in a real tough position. Because, as I said before, if anyone makes disclo uh, does disclosure, whether it's a U.S. president or whether it's Putin, the Pentagon military intelligence complex are all going to be the bad guys. They're going to be thrown under the bus. The politicians will say, oh, no, we wanted to tell you, but they wouldn't let us, or they didn't tell us, or we didn't know. They're the problem. And these people that have worked their whole lives to defend the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, uh, are pretty much all good people. They're all uh, honest, straightforward people. They're not rich. They don't make huge money. And the idea that they were going to be the, the historical scapegoats on this did not, did not please them. And they made a decision they need to make an, a, a, a preemptive move, primarily a public relations move. Uh, and they started thinking about that. And at the same time, a gentleman by the name of Tom DeLong had the same exact idea, and he was trying to present that idea to them. Uh, meaning you guys are the good guys, and, and uh, you need to start doing some things that show that and, and uh, become part of the solution. Uh, and while Tom DeLong, rock musician, is a somewhat unlikely person to be the titular head of this, uh, this maneuver, uh, that history sometimes goes that way. And so the net result is that through the end of 2015, early 2016, this, this project was put together on the inside where a certain number of individuals for, who are no longer working directly for the government mm -hmm would form an organization to pursue uh, areas of research and inquiry uh, and, and also develop media projects to bring information to the American people and it would clearly be coming from within the military intelligence complex. This is a very complicated and tricky maneuver and it took them a while and they put it together. Tom DeLong first referred to this, though he didn't get into specifics, in a March 27th interview with George Knapp on Coast to Coast, all of which I have recorded and inspected in great detail. And then we didn't hear anything. Uh, I believe, I strongly believe, their intention was to launch this, uh, this project shortly after Clinton was elected, but before she took the White House, because that way they would be ahead of the curve. If they didn't do that, she might start disclosure and it would be too late. So they had about a 70-day window there. But two things happened that, that blew everything up. One, WikiLeaks re uh, released a lot of emails, including those from Don John Podesta's files, which talks about the connections between Podesta and the To The Stars team and, and DeLong. Uh, this was not supposed to be public. That was a bit of a problem for them, but okay, if she wins the election, we move forward. Then she loses the election. And so the whole project was blown up. It, it, they, they, they stood down for 11 months before they eventually, for whatever reason, and I could speculate on that, announced the To the Stars Academy of Arts and Science. It's an awkward name. I refer to it as To the Stars Academy. With Tom DeLong as the CEO of a, uh, of a uh, uh, benefits corporation, right? Public benefits corporation to pursue a range of goals and with a team of individuals that included former 30-year CIA high-level people, DIA, the Skunk Works at Lockheed, uh, political uh, operatives working from uh, the Senate and House, an extraordinary group of individuals, including a number of people dealing in genetic sciences, which is a big tip-off that eventually on their agenda was the contact phenomenon. 
though they didn't emphasize that. Uh, they launched on October 11th and then delivered a bunch of information to the New York Times for review that ended up becoming a fully vetted story. Two articles written in December the 16th that generated in a, quite a bit of global attention. So they're, they're off and running. But what they, what they found out, and probably may have suspected might happen, was that this huge announcement out of the New York Times was ultimately and fairly quickly subsumed into the geopolitical storm going on in America and the focus on the president that is virtually consuming the political media in this country. And there's almost nothing you could announce that would not eventually be shoved to the back of the line. And so they decided rather than to try to pursue this further for now, they stood down. And they have been generally very quiet, except in the, in the public arena. And so since uh, January of, of this year, there's been some behind the scenes activity. I know some of this team has met with people on the Hill. I guess you could call that lobbying, though again, not public, all behind the scenes. DeLong has been meeting with some media people in, in Hollywood about major projects, uh, but that's not known to the general public. And so, as I mentioned before, uh, I believe where we are now is the To The Stars Academy project and all of its potential possibilities is waiting for a change of state in Washington. They are waiting to see what happens with the present administration. Now, to put the cap on this, again, for those that want to take the time to review this entire history of this project and who's in it and what's going on, they will hopefully conclude, as I do, that right now that's the most important development in the disclosure process. Uh, they are leading the disclosure movement, only things are a little bit quiet right now. Mm -hmm. And that they are making history at an extraordinary level. They've released the first gun camera footage ever of UAP intercepts by military planes and so forth. Uh, and there's more to come, and they've made it clear there's more to come. And so the To The Stars Academy may be, the, the uh, of all the players that have been on the field since 1940s, uh, many of my colleagues, for instance, some of which are now gone, of all the players, as we try to move this ball down the field, it looks now like it will be the two of the Stars Academy that will take the ball over the end zone and score the touchdown. Um, taking a look into 2020, what do you think will happen if, let's say, Bernie Sanders wins the White House or any of the other, what is it now, 26, 27 contenders? Like it, yeah, I've, Steve, I've never seen a political arena look like this before. It looks more like a three-ring circus. Well, it was a three-ring circus the last time. Remember how yeah. many Republican candidates exactly. there were? Exactly, yeah. Look, it's circus time down here in the U.S. What can I say? Uh, well, this all comes into the same, the same point, that right now the disclosure prospects are in a somewhat of a suspension while the players await to see what's going to happen with the current administration. If that means something happening within the next 30 or 40 days, which is quite possible, fine. If not, then it will be after the next election. Possibly. Uh, and uh, I believe that, let's just say that uh, if, if, if there is a significant change uh, uh, in the outcome of the next election, right. Uh, it's probably going to be favoring disclosure. In other words, I think most people are going to be comfortable with moving forward under that next, if it's a significant change. All right, Steve, stand by. We've got to take our final break. Explanation, Stephen Bassett is our guest this hour, www.paradigmresearchgroup.org. And Steve and I will be back as we wrap up this hour here in the Exxon from our broadcast center and studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. I'm Rob McConnell. Don't go away.
Welcome back, everyone. Stephen Bassett is my special guest, and for all of you within the Cable 14 viewing area on Kojiko and Rogers TV, uh, Steve is my guest this week on the Exxon TV show, and that's 9.30 this coming Tuesday on Cable 14. As always, Steve, great having you with us. Thanks so much for all the hard work that you've done over the years. Um, I wanted to ask you about your, your opinion on what's going on with Senator Harry Reid, his black project and uh, let me see George Knapp and Pan Pandolfi and the other, and the rest of the gang uh, first of all uh, George Knapp is a key player here he's he, he's he's a journalist of course yeah top investigative journalist and he has always been close to this issue and he has been the number one journalist to continue to engage and and bring out information about the to the stars Academy since the announcement no one else is even close to that um, uh, and, and 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 because Robert Bigelow is part of the unfolding developments with Through the Stars, mm -hmm. and he knows him well, that's good. He also knows Harry Reid, and so a lot of what we're we're learning is through George Knapp's journalism. And and I have those interviews up on my website, um, over a hundred various interviews of very people, including almost all of George Knapp's stuff. Uh, in a short, um, Bigelow is key to this. And, and just five months before the announcement of the To The Stars Academy is when Bigelow told 60 Minutes uh, in a interview, national interview, that, that there's an ET presence here, just flat out said it, uh, which was pretty profound. And again, got kind of absorbed into the media, mm -hmm. political media uh, storm going on here. Uh, and that was planned, I believe, because then the announcement of the To The Stars came in October. When that announcement was made, as we know, the New York Times articles had followed, uh, announced that Bigelow was involved in some of the research uh, of a project that was initially started by Harry Reid uh, and, and, and supported by uh, Senator, uh, the late Senator, in a way, the late Senator Stevens to get a project going in the, in the Pentagon to uh, more to, to engage the ET issue. Fine. The Pentagon didn't want to do it uh, because they've been engaging the ET issue forever. But uh, you don't turn down the, the Senate Majority Leader. It's all good. I mean, it's all it all helped advance the issue and ultimately lead to the, to the Stars Academy, because the head of that project up until the last days was uh, 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 Luis Elizondo, who then left the government to become a key player uh, in the To the Stars Academy. Uh, in the two years since, Harry Reid has not been shy about giving interviews, particularly to George Knapp, calling for more investigations in front of the Congress and so forth. Uh, and quite frankly, uh, I think that he's quite comfortable in doing that because he's dying of pancreatic cancer. And so he's got nothing to lose. I mean, he doesn't care. It's like, hey, I, I, yeah, I did that. I, I vouched for that program. I got right. the money. It's real. It's important. And I'm continuing to speak out. Um, and in that sense, uh, Harry Reid is going out uh, with, uh, with some dignity and uh, as an important, important spokesperson. I think he's... He's leaving a last, a last legacy for himself and the nation, and I'm quite proud of that. What's the truth behind Skinwalker Ranch? Something very strange was going on there, there's no question. Uh, Bigelow was one of, did most of the research. He bought the ranch. They researched it for some time. Uh, most of that has been kept private, uh, not revealed. Uh, Knapp, of course, has, has talked about it quite a bit. A documentary, I think, is either out or in the works. There may, there, there's probably an ET connection, but there may be some other things going on. Eventually, though, I think the phenomena began to dissipate. Uh, Bigelow sold the ranch, and there we go. So, uh, what exactly was going on there? By and large, the, based on things that Knapp has said, I think ultimately they, 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 something, there was some very strange things going on, but they never really figured out exactly how and what. Uh, but I could be wrong there. The, the the universe is complicated. I don't believe in the paranormal. Everything in this universe is absolutely normal. Right. How could it be otherwise? Uh, there's much we have to learn. Uh, my my focus, of course, is on the ET thing right now, and to me, that's the principal phenomena that we need to deal with. Uh, so, the interesting developments of Skinwalker Ranch. Right. I hope to learn more about those, but I'm more interested in Robert Bigelow's. Uh, involvement in ET research, the metals research, the materials research, and also 
hoping that he may be able to step forward and help fund the advocacy movement on a broader scale so that the American people will have representation in Washington and in lobbying, and not just, say, the To The Stars people who are also going to be lobbying, but they are coming out of the military intelligence complex. And there's an advocacy movement out here that's trying to represent the people's interest. And, and so I, like, I hope you might do that as well. What, what, does, what happens to the, the UFO community or those like yourself who are pushing for disclosure when you have people like Major Ed Dames who is for many years talking about remote viewing, who is now saying that he has been contacted by remote viewing with extraterrestrials and he is going to have a meeting and first contact in May of this year? Uh, the engagement of... The, the, the an extraterrestrial presence is engaging the entire planet at seven and a half billion people. It's a really big deal. And there are huge numbers of people watching it, engaging it, and making you know, decisions about what to do. Uh, it's virtually impossible to follow it all. And every manner of, of, uh, of engagement will, will manifest. And some will be a little crazy, some will be very solid, some will be off the wall, who knows? Yeah. Uh, I, my job isn't to assess all of these things. Uh, uh, my job is to keep it pretty basic. Uh, we need, a, we need a, um, uh, an announcement from the heads of state so that we can start sorting all this out and get to the, to the, the core truths and not have to run around in circles for decade after decade pursuing uh, perhaps blind alleys in ephemera. But I do happen to know because the remote viewing programs were real, and a lot of the people involved have spoken in detail. And it's solid enough that I can say with some confidence that during many remote viewing sessions, during this research, extraterrestrials were, were seen in the remote viewing. So I certainly can't dismiss that idea. And that's one aspect. Now that's kind of deep stuff there, and not at the forefront of the disclosure movement. I can also add this that if we can finally break through the barrier of the truth embargo and get disclosure of the ET presence, there is a whole raft of other interesting things that have been looked at and studied by our government that I, I suspect we will learn about, and it will be highly interesting and hopefully uh, very helpful to uh, how we deal with the rest of the 21st century. How do you deal with people, Stephen, that you must meet who say, Oh, come on, what are you talking about, uh, you know, conspiracy or, or truth embargo? You know, what do you, it does, doesn't the world have more important things to do than talk about extraterrestrials? How do you deal with well, that? That, does, that? That doesn't happen anymore, Rob. It really? just doesn't happen. Every once in a while, a tweet or maybe a Facebook thing will pass, the odd email, but it's not common at all. Uh, by and large, the, the number of people that are figuring out that the ET presence is real and the disclosure process is obviously appropriate is, is, is growing very rapidly. And the number of people that are completely out of the loop on this or, or, or opposed yeah. is dropping. In other words, we, we, we've passed the tipping point in that regard. And so it's not a problem for me. And if somebody, and occasionally somebody will confront me on the web uh, with something very negative or dismissive, uh, I just, it's okay. I don't, I don't respond. I don't get into back and forth on that. I don't argue with people about these issues, by and large, very rarely. Uh, I understand that every individual out there will figure this out in their own good time. And it doesn't have to be right now. It doesn't have to be next week. And it certainly doesn't have to be because I have somehow pounded them with the power of my logic. Uh, because it's not needed. This history will unfold. If we don't. It, history and science is not a democracy in the sense that, well... Uh, the story will be this way based upon how many people feel that's the story. No, that's not the way science works and it's not the way reality works. Reality is what it is. It's not a democratic process. And so it, the ETs are not here or not here because X number of people believe it. They're here because they're here. But why do and so how many people but, figure it out is up to them. But, but why, do, why do so many people believe when there's very little physical evidence? 
Well, I have to disagree with you, Rob. There is an enormous amount of physical evidence. Where? Of course, it depends. Well, some people think the only thing that's physical evidence mm -hmm. would be a an ET in a cage, right? Or a fully operational ship, or, or even a crashed not. one. Uh, in terms of evidence, there is yeah. there are photos and film. There are uh, trace cases, right? Uh, mutilated cattle, crop circles that humans couldn't possibly do. Mm -hmm. Uh, radar logs, um, materiel, which of course is now becoming more known, uh, and of course over nearly a million contact reports submitted by email and mails to various researchers around the world. That's physical evidence, Rob. That's a mass of physical evidence. Steve, you would never want to go with that much evidence into a trial for your life. You'd lose. Either that or the evidence would be disproved only as circumstantial and you'd lose the case. Well, you know, that's true. Technically, any single piece of evidence can be dismissed. That's but right. The 70 years of evidence that is amassed regarding the ET presence is absolutely overwhelming. Hey, Stephen, I, I, hate, I hate to do this, my good friend. You and I have to say so long for now. Always a great pleasure speaking to you. Con continued success, Steve, and safe travels to you, my friend. Look forward to being back in Canada soon. All right, buddy. ExoNation, our guest this hour has been Stephen Bassett, www.paradigmresearchgroup.org. We'll be back on the other side of this break as we continue here in the Exxon from our broadcast center and studios in Hamilton. Don't go away. Mm -hmm.